Thank you, choir. It's always great to hear the choir there, and we appreciate those who serve there in that. Speaking of those who served, we just want to take the opportunity uh, to say thank you for those who came out yesterday. We had a work day there yesterday, and were able to get kind of several different projects uh, started and going, and, and uh, we appreciate all those who came out. We uh, started off with a breakfast, because like good Baptists, we can't do anything without eating first, and uh, DJ and Susie did a great job, and we appreciate it there. And uh, after, it's it's hard to go out and work after you've had a full belly there. But we were able to do that, and uh, we were able to get some of the drop ceiling started down in the, the downstairs uh, women's bathroom. Uh, there was um, some wallpaper that was hung in the men's bathroom. There was some uh, cleaning that was done in the back gardens, as well as some limbs that were cut off there as well. And then DJ had done some on an ends electrical work here throughout there as well. And so we appreciate all those who came out and worked. Uh, I think sometimes the, the enjoyable part that I always enjoy these work days is not just the work that gets done. We appreciate that it uh, helps the project come along. And we appreciate those who help with that. I, I enjoy the fellowship of just being able to uh, spend the day together with, uh, I know we had five or six guys down there working together and it's always just a blessing uh, it's a time just to enjoy being together with each other, and so thank you very much for those who came out and did that. We appreciate that. If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we are turning there to Second Kings chapter 2 is where we're headed. Uh, before we get to there, we'll go to the Lord in prayer there this morning, and uh, as we Get ready to pray. I think this morning we want to take the opportunity just to remember uh, some of those who are shut in. Uh, we have uh, several folks within our congregation who are unable to make it out there uh, because of health and because of uh, just kind of where they are. And so just continue to remember to pray for them. We always want to kind of to lift them up there in our prayer. They may not be with us, but they're a part of us. And uh, we want to remember those. And then just remember... Uh, those who maybe just temporarily aren't able to make it here, there through illness or through traveling, that we, uh, we remember them there as well. And so let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we uh, thank you for the promises that we have here from your word, where we can t test you, try you, and prove you. The, the, been invited just to come and just to put you to the test because you are a faithful God. And God, we are grateful that you are a faithful God, that uh, we worship you there this morning. This morning as we come together, this morning we think especially of those who are unable to join us, who uh, are members and those who are a part of us, and Lord, because of health or illness or other adversity that keeps them away from being together here with the, the congregation, with the family today, Lord, we just pray that you would 
uh, just bless and watch over them, that you would just strengthen them and encourage them where they're at. Lord, we pray that you would be with us, that we would be your hands and feet and would encourage and strengthen them, that we'd minister to them and call and visit and make sure that they um, are cared for there during this time. So Lord, we just pray that you would just be with us during this time as well, that as we gather around, uh, Lord, may you speak to us through your word. May your spirit uh, move within our midst here today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are at 2 Kings chapter 2. And this morning we're going to look at something, uh, for some reason in our day and age, in our society, we do not like to talk about death very much. Matter of fact, most times we do about everything we can to avoid this conversation about death. Uh, and I think it's wise sometimes that we do. I remember one time uh, we had a, a gentleman in our uh, church, uh, Tom, and uh, Tom was coming and he was looking at buying a car. And that's just kind of a common everyday thing. But he was looking at buying a car. And what stuck out to me, what it sounded to me, is that we was talking about buying a car. He said, this is probably be the last car that I ever buy in my lifetime. And I, you know, I, whenever I buy a car, I never thought about thinking like, this is the last car that I'll ever buy. And, and it just stuck out to me. But he was at that point of life that he was realizing that his days were short he was in his final chapter. He didn't know how long he had, but that was probably uh, coming soon to a close. Just recently, as we were part of our Bible study, the speaker there in our Bible study said that his wife was a hospice and worked in hospice. And he said the currency in the hospice, uh, that people value in hospice, is not like what car you drive or what the size of your house is or what clothes are you wearing. So the currency that people value in hospice is how many people come to visit you in that time. I think it's important, it's wise that we live with our end in mind. And so this morning we're going to be talking about ending well, looking at Elijah's last chapter and, uh, where God translates him from earth there to heaven. And we want to encourage you to think about the end in mind. Um, the reality is we don't know when that end is. Uh, some of us, we are hoping that it's a long way from now. And some of you uh, are beginning to realize that you may be in some of your final chapters that's a lot closer than it was a little while ago. How do we end well? Uh, we want to end this race. We want to end the race well. We don't want to, to quit or to be knocked out in the final legs of the race. We want to end this race well. And so as we look at it, there's four things this morning I want to share with you. I think that we can get from this passage that will help us to end well. Starting in verse 1, it says this, And it came to pass that when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now, the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. And then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophet who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And so he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. And then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophet went and stood facing them at a distance. And while the two of them stood by the Jordan, Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that. And so the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was that when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, 
it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. And then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with the horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And so he saw them no more. And he took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them into two pieces. And he took up the mantle of Elijah that was fallen from him, and he went back, and he stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. And when the sons of the prophet who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. Here we have in this passage where Elijah is caught up there into heaven. And as we study the scriptures, we understand that he is one of two people that have that rare and unique privilege of stepping into heaven without experiencing death. And Elijah is the second here of these two who is caught up in the whirlwind, uh, not in the chariot of fire. The chariot of fire was present, but he was caught up in the whirlwind uh, there into heaven, and God translates him. And, and so as we look at this, we looking at the life of Elijah, want to understand from Elijah how, Elijah, how can we end our life well, how can we end that final chapter well before God takes us from this world into the next? And so first thing that I want to encourage you with, right, end well by encouraging the growth of others. It's interesting as we come here, uh, in this last chapter of Elijah's life, what he seems to do here is a farewell tour. Uh, obviously, under the direction of God, he leaves where he's at. He first starts at Gilgal. Then they go from Gilgal to Bethel, then from Bethel to Jericho, from Jericho across the Jordan. As he comes to two of these places, both Bethel and Jericho, what he encourages or encounters is uh, the sons of the prophets. And so he does this farewell too, where he comes to where these sons of the prophets are. And the sons of the prophets uh, are probably similar to what we'd understand today as a Bible school or a seminary. Uh, they were those that were training in ministry who would take over the ministry that Elijah uh, had begun. And so it's encouraging both to see that even in the midst of these dark days and the times there uh, of idolatry, and as the people were falling away from God, that there was a faithful group, a, a core of people who were faithful not only to serve the Lord, but also to encourage others and to continue on that ministry. And they were multiplying those as they were encouraging these others into ministry. So as we look at this, we see uh, that Elijah is encouraging others, right? Uh, as going to each of these schools, the prophets, probably what he's doing there is he's just sharing with them, encouraging them, inspiring them and saying, like, I, I know my time is short. I'm about ready to step off this scene. This is now your time. Here's what you need to do. And begins to share some of his experience. But essentially is just encouraging these guys into the ministry. Don't quit. Don't give up. Be faithful to God. God's faithful to you. And he's inspiring them in others. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. We often reference this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul is saying to Timothy there at the end of his life, right? The same things that you've heard of me, you commit to faithful men that they may teach others. As Elijah looks at the last chapter of his life, what is a priority to him is inspiring others to serve God. And I think that's encouraging because what we see is this, is that he served all the way to the very end. Um, sometimes as we get older, we begin to think, ah, I've done my time, I've put that in, uh, it's now uh, somebody else's time. I, I'm going to kind of step down and retire from ministry. I'm going to step down and retire from serving the Lord. And somebody else can step up and do that. And uh, what we see here in Elijah is he never said, I've done my time. I, I'm too old for this. I just I can't handle this anymore. This ministry is just too hard. It's time that some of these other young guys just step up and start doing this. No, he's going around investing into the lives of others up until his very last days. He's serving the Lord and being a blessing there to others. I think it challenges us that we need to kind of make that choice. I know that sometimes as we get older, 
and I'm, I'm beginning to get more and in, more into this area that as we get older, life becomes increasingly difficult. Things begin to hurt that didn't hurt before. Recovery takes longer. Uh, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time just to get out of the bed and just to begin to get moving, functioning. Um, and as things begin to ache and hurt and more injuries and illnesses become more common, we're tempted to focus more on ourselves and begin to complain about what's not going right. And so you begin to look back of what we felt like we were more profitable and more productive in the past. We begin to live back in the past rather than in the present. And we begin not only to complain about what's not working right, but about things just aren't like they used to be. I remember back when, and I think it's, it's a wonderful thing to enjoy the memories of the past. It's a great thing to learn from the memories of the past. It is a bad thing to live in the past. And there's a temptation as we get older that we're tempted to live in the past and to neglect and forget about the present. One of the encouraging things that we see about Elijah is this, even as he's coming towards the end, the focus here is not on all the things that you know, could be wrong. He's not giving his kind of his hospital list of the things and Uh, I remember back when I was ministering to Ahab, and instead, he's investing in the lives of those today. He's taking time to encourage others and to say, that here's where the ministry is. He's looking forward to the future as he's investing into the life of Elisha, knowing that Elisha will carry on his ministry there after him. I think one of the ways that we can end well is by encouraging others the growth of others. How are we blessing others and helping to bring them along? How are we living and being present at the moment, serving God where he's placed us right now, even if that place is increasingly difficult and painful? The second area that we see Elijah did well is by inspiring perseverance in others. Now, hopefully as you were uh, following along here in this passage, you notice that kind of that repetitive pattern that takes place here in this passage. And the repetitive pattern that takes place is, starting first there, before they get to Gilgal, uh, Elijah says, um, stay here, uh, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. And so uh, Gilgal, he says to Elisha, you stay here, uh, and Elijah, or Elisha, and so I, I know it gets confusing even to me saying these, uh, Elisha says, as the Lord lives, as your soul is, I will not leave you. And so they went from there to Bethel. When he gets to Bethel, he's getting ready to leave Bethel. He says, please stay here. And Elisha said the same thing, right? I, as my soul lives and as you live, I will not leave you. They get to Jericho. He says the same thing at Jericho. They get to the banks of the Jordan. He says the same thing at Jordan. Uh, several times he encourages Elisha to stay. But what we see in Elisha is perseverance that he persevered all the way to the end. Elisha's loyalty was tested at each stop. And at each stop, Elijah kind of encouraged him to stay. Now, uh, we don't know why Elijah encouraged him to stay. And we can speculate on a couple of the different reasons. Uh, I think one of the reasons may have been that Elijah wanted to go through this alone. Uh, There's a natural tendency that we have, right, as we kind of go through difficult things that we often withdraw from other people. And so uh, being aware that maybe the end is in sight, he's withdrawing from those that God has placed around him. Thankfully, Elisha didn't let him. Elisha said, as you're living and as I'm living, I'm going to be right here. As God's alive, I'm going to be right here. You're not getting rid of me. Now, that's my paraphrase uh, there of that. It could have been that Elijah was thinking of Elisha and the pain that would come losing both his mentor and his leader, his friend. And he's thinking, if if, if you're not there, maybe it'll spare you the pain. Like, uh, it won't hurt as much if you're not there. So you stay here and then you'll only hear about it later on. Uh, And it may have been that he's thinking, I know that sometimes when uh, that final chapter is there, people look at ways to try and preserve. prevent their loved ones from experiencing pain. I, I think sometimes we just need to realize, and I think it's, it's not a, always a bad, it's a difficult thing, but it's not a bad thing that when we lose a loved one, there's going to be pain. 
that pain is a, sin, a symbol or a sign of the love that we had and a love that can't just be replaced, right? It's not like a puppy, you can just go buy a new puppy. Uh, we can't replace the love of a person when that person is lost. We will experience pain. Uh, we, we just need to be aware of it. We need to lean into it. It's a part of life. It actually means that we experience something good and joyful, something that we regret losing, that we wish we still had there with us. Pain is a part of their life. It uh, may have been uh, there that he wanted to test Elisha's perseverance. Elisha, are you going to stay with me to the end, or when things get difficult, are you going to bail out? Uh, coming to the end chapters of life is oftentimes when things begin to get difficult. And do we persevere to the end, or are we in there for convenience sake? We certainly live in a society that is focused on convenience. And when it's not convenient, when it's no longer uh, beneficial to both of us, we walk away. Uh, and yet, God wants us to persevere. We need to persevere and be loyal to our friends. We need to be loyal to our marriages, we need to be loyal to the church that God has placed us in. We need perseverance in there. If we're going to be used by God in helping others, we have to stick it out through the difficult times. And so he's testing Elisha's perseverance. And gratefully, right, uh, Elisha persevered. We need perseverance if we're going to serve the Lord. Uh, if you're going to serve the Lord in any type of capacity, here, here the difficult times will come. It, it is certain difficult times will come. Painful times will come. Things that we're confused, we don't always know the answer. They will come. Are we going to quit and abandon the Lord when things get difficult? Are we going to be faithful and to stick it out and to persevere? And Elijah knows that better than anybody. He has... Uh, been on the run, he's been in hiding, uh, he's experienced difficulty. Uh, if he would have quit at the first sign of trouble, there never would have been a prophet Elijah. Uh, perseverance is necessary in order to serve the Lord. And one of the things that he wants to develop in Elisha is this. Elisha, are you going to stick with it or are you going to bail out? And he's encouraging Elisha to stick with it. We need to stick with it. We need to be faithful to the Lord even when the road is hard because the road will be hard, right? Uh, I, I don't want to sell you this false view uh, of relationship or of serving the Lord. You, there will be difficult times. It is a blessing and the reward at the end is great, but there are bumps in the road. It is a difficult road at times and we need to persevere and to stick with it. Elijah encouraged Elisha to persevere. And he gave him that opportunity. Matter of fact, it leads us into the next part here when he said, if you'll stick with me to the end. And Elisha was able to do it. And so that's the third thing that we see here is this. Uh, we need to end well by speaking blessing over others. They go first to Gilgal, and then to Bethel, and then to Jericho, and then from Jericho, you're right on the, the border of the Jordan River, and they get ready to cross the Jordan River, and they get to the other side of the Jordan River. Elijah finally turns to Elisha, and he says, ask, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, you have this blank check. You have the opportunity. And so that's what we see. Elijah asked to bless uh, his servants. Now, it's a couple of interesting things that we see taking place, even before we get there to uh, the Jordan. As they come to the Jordan, right, what does Elijah do? Um, I hope you noticed this, that he took off his mantle, his cloak, uh, he rolls it up, and he strikes the Jordan River. Again, it, it kind of identifies as we, we've looked at this, so there's kind of a parallel between Elijah and Moses, and this is what Moses did, helping to lead the nation of Israel. There's a parallel between these two. Uh, he does it. Now, Moses did it, right, as a sign to show them the deliverance, that God was delivering them out of bondage. The, the, our parallel to being taken out of sin, out of slavery, and being brought there into the, that new life in Jesus Christ. Moses did it to show them that, that deliverance. Why is Elijah parting the waters? 
That's an interesting question because there really doesn't seem to be a good reason for it here, at least on the surface. It just seems to be a manifestation or a show of the power of God, that God has the power to part the waters. And so he strikes the waters, and the waters go this way and that, and they walk through on dry ground. Both Elijah and Elisha walk through on dry ground. Now, it'll, it'll come into play a, a little bit later on, and it helps to remind us of an important truth. But he demonstrates God's power, that God has the power there over creation. But then as they get to the other side, he asks the question. And I think it's important to even to note the fact that he asked the question. He said, Elijah, what, Elisha, what, what do you want me to do for you? Ask, ask the question. It's a blank check that I'm asked, giving to you. What do you want me to do? And I think it's a good thing to be reminded of this, right? Oftentimes when we don't know, or even if we think we do know, it's always wise to ask questions. Questions help us to understand. Too often we assume we know what's going on. We assume we know the answer to the question. And so he asks this question. You have the opportunity to ask, ask. What do you want me to do for you? Uh, and we need to be asking good questions. And so he takes this opportunity to bless Elisha, who has been faithful to serve him for these past years. And so he says, ask anything you want. And Elijah, or Elisha asks for a unique request. Right? Did, did you see that request that he began to ask for there in verse 9? The, the last part of verse 9. He says, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now, as we first look at that, we might ask the question to say, well, it seems like there that Elisha is pretty greedy, isn't it? I mean, like, it's not just enough to say, let me kind of do the same thing, but let me have a double portion. Like, he, he, he wants twice as much. You had 10, give me 20. Uh, is it about greed or is it about pride? Because oftentimes that's what we... we uh, are tempted with, like, we want, like, I want double the platform. You, you minister to 3,000 people. I want 6,000 people. I want double. Is this about pride? Is this about greed? What is going on here? What he's asking is, can I be the successor to your ministry? God has blessed you and has given you this ministry. Can I be the successor? If you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, back towards Deuteronomy chapter 21. And it deals with the laws of inheritance there in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17. When the firstborn, they were dividing up the inheritance, the firstborn would receive a double portion. The firstborn was given that responsibility after the father would pass away that he would become the leader of of the father, the family. As he would lead the family, it would fall to him to, uh, if the father left behind a widow or the mother was passed away or there was other family dependents that were depending upon the family, it was then the firstborn's responsibility to care for them. And so the firstborn was given a double portion. So if there were four kids, they would take that inheritance, they would divide it five ways the firstborn would receive two portions and everybody else would receive one portion. But he would also have that responsibility that he would be the one then to lead the family. And because he would lead that family, he would need that double portion to care for those who are depending upon him. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17. But he shall acknowledge that the son of the unloved wife is the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Uh, and so the firstborn was given that, that double portion. Uh, and so that's what Elijah is asking. Can you give me a double portion? Can I become the leader, the successor? Can I inherit the ministry that you've begun? And can I continue what God has started with you? Now, Elijah recognizes that that's a difficult request that you're asking. But he says, if you remain with me until the very end, you'll experience God's blessing. If you see me when I'm taken away, then God will give you. Now, we understand this, that Elijah in himself does not have the power to do this. The blessing or the ministry was God's ministry, and the succession was God's to call who would step into that role after him. And so apparently as Elijah gives this blessing, he does so uh, with the Lord's approval 
uh, there with the Lord's direction. And so there's kind of a condition to it. That condition that we've already mentioned is if you watch me as I'm taken away, God will give it to you. But if you don't watch me, God won't. And so you have to, again, remain to the very end. We talk about perseverance. His perseverance would determine his blessing. I think that's even still true today, right? Uh, if we remain faithful with God, we experience greater blessing than when the difficulties and the times come, we begin to bail out on God. Perseverance determines the blessing. But it also reminds us here this, is that we need to speak blessing over the lives of others. That our words have great power and influence in the lives of others. And one of the ways that Elijah was able to end well was by blessing Elisha and, and giving that opportunity to say, to ask, ask whatever you want. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can here to bless you, but what is it that you want? How can I bless you? I want to encourage us to realize that our words have great power. Proverbs tells us that our, our words have the power to give life. Proverbs 18, 21. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, let's look at a couple of these because I think this is important for us to learn and to uh, put into practice on a daily basis. Uh, regardless of whether you're in your last chapter or whether uh, you are hoping that God gives you many more chapters to come, we need to learn to speak blessing into the life of others. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, right? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Uh, as we talk about being in the final chapter, you've probably been familiar with, you've been around some people that the older they get, the grouchier and the crabbier they get. And like, you don't want to spend time with them. Like, it's family reunion time, but be careful about Uncle So-and-so over there, because he's just a little crabby. Uh, we don't want to be those people. I've also experienced on the other end of that, I think of uh, Pastor Guy Morton was a, an elder senior pastor when we served in other areas. And you enjoyed being around Pastor Guy. And that, that was his name, Guy. Uh, you, you enjoyed being around Pastor Guy because every time you saw him, he said some type of encouraging word, some word of blessing. You wanted to be around him. You enjoyed spending time with him because he spoke blessing into the life of others. As we look at this, our are we going to speak blessing into others, or are we going to complain, criticize, tear down? What type of words are we speaking into the life of others? Proverbs says, death and life is in the power of the tongue. If you have the opportunity to tear somebody down, to, to destroy them, uh, a quick word of criticism, a thoughtless, callous word, an angry word, uh, just uh, kind of a careless word given off at a moment, we say, oh, it's just, it, was, it didn't mean anything by it. Ask that to the person who remembers that word 10, 20 years later. Or you have the opportunity to speak life, to speak praise and encouragement, to uh, recognize them when they're doing well, to encourage them as the future, as you're looking there to the future, to praise them for the things that they've done, to get, speak opportunity there into them. If we come into the New Testament, we see that same truth, that same principle, the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And it reminds us here of this wonderful truth, right? Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is necessary, edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. As followers of Jesus Christ, our words, our language, should impart grace to the hearers. It ought to build people up. It ought to be a demonstration of the grace that we've received. Uh, and we ought to be building and encouraging others. I think it's by no accident that Elisha has a great and prosperous ministry. It's because he had a cheerleader in Elijah who not only demonstrated how to do it, but was also saying, you can do this. You've got the ability. God, God will give you the power. You can do this. Stick with it. You can do this. And speaking blessing there made a difference in Elisha's life. 
they cross the Jordan as they're walking there. And, and I don't know if you noticed it. I, I thought that was kind of a, a, just a, a sweet thing to see there, that as they're walking there across the other side of the Jordan, uh, they know it's going to be soon. They don't know when it's going to happen. But it said there in verse 11 that it happened as they continued on and talked. Uh, they're just two friends walking along on the other side of Jordan. I don't know that Elijah knows where he's going, but Elisha knows he's going wherever Elijah's going. That's, that's the only thing that Elisha knows. Wherever you're at is where I'm going to be at. And so Elijah's saying, well, God's called me to the other side of the Jordan uh, there. And so they're just walking along. They're just talking. And as they're walking along and talking, the next thing we see is the chariots of fire and the horsemen. And those begin to appear there off in a distance, and apparently they get closer and closer and closer, and it says that they split the two of them, that this chariot arrives right in between Elisha and Elijah, and it separates the two of them. Maybe they have to kind of jump out of the way in order to avoid this chariot. And then, as they're separated, a whirlwind comes and takes Elijah up. Elijah is taken out of the scene. And it reminds us here of the last thing we will look at. The end well by passing on the baton. Uh, we know that reference there. It's that reference there of a uh, relay race. And uh, there in a relay race, we know one of the most difficult parts of a relay race is the passing off of the baton. Uh, how well to do that. Actually, races are won and lost in that brief time where you're passing off the baton. If you can do that successfully, it means the other team member is able to go on well, and you're able to do well there in the race. And so uh, we need to end well by passing off the baton. We see here in the story that Elijah was taken up there by the whirlwind. Uh, the only other person to experience being translated into heaven is Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, was Enoch. Enoch was caught up there into heaven. We understand that this is a a beautiful picture for us of our hope, the blessed hope of the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and we are looking forward to that time where we will be caught up, just like Elijah and Enoch were caught up. We will be caught up into heaven without experiencing death. But if that is not the case, then the rest of us will uh, experience death before we step into eternity. That's oftentimes we talk about crossing the Jordan, right? Uh, and oftentimes that reference of crossing the Jordan is experiencing death. As Elijah crossed the Jordan and then was taken into heaven, the uh, majority of us are probably going to experience death before we step into eternity. We don't know when that day is. And we need to live in such a way that we are prepared at any moment to step into eternity. I think first and foremost of that is this. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not prepared for eternity. If you step into eternity without Christ as your Savior, you'll step into eternal judgment into hell. And the only way that we can avoid that is putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ by repenting of our sins and by uh, trusting and believing in what Jesus Christ has done for us on our behalf. We need to know for sure that Christ is our Savior. Every one of us will stand before Jesus Christ. Are we prepared for that day? Death is coming. I can say that with 100% certainty. Death is coming. We need to prepare for that day. Elijah was caught up. But as Elijah was caught up, you'll notice that I... And I, I, I've wondered about this. I don't know whether the mantle fell off or whether Elijah threw it off. But in verse 14, right, he, uh, he, then he, Elisha, took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. Apparently, as that whirlwind caught Elijah up into heaven, the mantle comes off, his cloak falls off, and it falls to the ground. And I, uh, again, this is not by accident, right? It, it, the same way in which the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace made it through the fiery furnace and their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. This is not by an accident. God's like, oh man, I, I didn't get all of his clothes. I'm going to have to go back and get that mantle. No, it, it's 
by intention, by God's sovereign design and purpose, that the mantle comes off and it falls to the ground. And, and, and I find it interesting because one of the first things that we see is before he picks it up, what does Elisha do? Elisha rends or tears his clothes. It's a symbol of mourning, right? It's a symbol of mourning that Elijah is, Elisha is mourning his friend who is lost. He's just lost his leader and his mentor. He's lost his friend. Uh, and he goes through grief. We experience grief. Grief is a part of life. Uh, we need to learn to grieve. And so he grieves by tearing his clothes. He takes his clothes and he rims, rips them there in two. And then he goes over to the mantle where Elijah had dropped the mantle, and he picks up the mantle. The mantle, we understand, is a symbol of the power or the authority of God. Just like Moses had the rod, and the rod for Moses was a symbol of the power of God, that when he would use it to strike the water or he would hold it up there in battle, uh, it was a demonstration of the power of God. The mantle here for Elijah is a demonstration of the power of God, of the anointing of God's Holy Spirit upon Elijah for the ministry that he had called him to. And so Elisha picks up the mantle and begins to put it on. Matter of fact, he picks up the mantle as he knows that God has now taken away his leader. He begins to head back to Jericho to where the school of the prophets was across the other side of the Jordan. And when he comes to Jordan, what does he do? He takes that mantle and he asks, where is the God of Elijah, and he strikes the water, and what happens? The water goes this way and that. You notice it's the same exact thing that happened for Elijah. Why is that happening? What's the significance of that? It's just just so we can see, man, God's got power. I mean, look at what God can do to nature. Uh, no, this is God reminding Elisha, and as well as the school of the prophets, right, that Elijah's power in ministry didn't come from Elijah. It came from God. And while Elijah is taken off the scene, God is still here. God is still present and with us and in our midst. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Sometimes we have a beloved leader who has done a great job at leading us, and we have appreciated what they've done, but God takes them off the scene. And what we need to realize is ministry uh, isn't dependent upon a leader. Ministry depends upon God. And the same God that that beloved leader served is the same God that is present with us today, whose power is still here in our midst. And Elisha is reminded, where is the God of Elijah? He's right here with you. And he is helping your ministry here today. And God is still present. We can still trust in God, and God is still doing great and powerful things here in our midst. And so Elisha takes that, and as the, the 50 uh, sons of the prophets see that, they all of a sudden recognize the spirit of Elijah now rests on Elisha. He has become the heir apparent to the ministry, but God's power is resting upon him and it just reminds us there of that truth that we need to prepare others to lead ministry as well. It's a great privilege and a great blessing for when God calls us to serve in whatever capacity that He serves us in, whether it's teaching children or whether it's uh, teaching a Sunday school class or maybe it's leading a ministry or whatever capacity we have of serving God. It's a great blessing to do that, but we need to realize that the ministry belongs to God and not to me. And so, since it's not my ministry, I need to prepare this ministry for others to lead this ministry as well. And I think sometimes one of the, the hardest things that we can do is coming to that point of recognizing that a leader is well prepared. I need to step out, and they need to step up. When to pass the baton, and when to, to pass that mantle over, and when to let the... That can be some of the most difficult, letting go of the reins and letting go of the power and to say, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be a cheerleader and a supporter. I'm going to be a blessing to you, but you're it. You're in charge now. I'm stepping back. You're stepping up. Even if you lead differently, your style of leadership, I, I wouldn't have done it that way, but I'm not in charge anymore. God's called you to that ministry. 
I'm going to encourage you. You do what God's called you to do. I'm going to be a blessing. How can I encourage you? How can I lift you up? And that's what takes place here. Elijah passes the mantle on. And I think it's also important to notice this, that Elisha picked up the mantle. We need some younger people to pick up the mantle. Uh, Some people that are willing to step up and to say, God, I want you to use me to serve you. Uh, You've blessed us with these other leaders, but you're also moving some of these other leaders on. I need you to use me to serve you. And we need some younger people to pick up that mantle, to, to take the baton and say, it's now it's my leg of the race to run. The story ends, it's an interesting end of the story. The 50 prophets, or 50 sons of the prophets are the school of the prophets are there at Jericho and they come to Elisha and they say, uh, your master's not here with us. Uh, we've got 50 strong men, 50 athletes here. Why don't we go out and send a search party? And Elisha said, there's no need, don't, don't bother. And they just, they kept pestering him. We would say they kept nagging him. And so finally, after Elisha is embarrassed, and we could probably even guess that he's embarrassed for them, he says, okay, go, go look for him. They take these 50 guys, they go in all the different directions, they go for three days. At the end of three days, they come back to Jericho, and they say, man, we're tired, we're exhausted, we looked everywhere, we couldn't find him anywhere. And Elisha goes, I told you so, I told you not to go, but you went anyway. Uh, they came to recognize that the power of Elisha is now rest, or Elijah is now resting on Elisha, and Elisha becomes the leader, begins to share the voice of God to the people of God here in Israel. As we look at this, I want to challenge you with two things today. One is this, are you speaking blessing into the people around you? To kind of follow up with that question, the question is a little bit more pointed to say, are you your words marked by encouragement, acceptance, and inspiration, or by complaints and criticism? And if you're not sure about this, you could find a person that you trust and to ask them that question. Are my words marked by encouragement and inspiration or by complaints and criticism? Be careful asking that question. You may not like the answer. Sometimes we become blind to even our own complaints and criticism. We develop a critical spirit and we think we're, we're encouraging these people. But in reality, we're criticizing them. We want to speak blessing. Let's be somebody that encourages and inspires others to follow God and to step up and to serve God and to build into their lives so that they have that opportunity to take that baton and go on. Let's speak words of blessing. Secondly, how will you end well by helping others to serve the Lord? It's not about us. It's about serving God as we serve others. And so how are we inspiring, encouraging, assisting others to serve the Lord? We're going to serve until our very last days. You know, it may come to the point in time that our health only lets us encourage others we can't get out we can't do the job physically anymore we can pick up the phone and inspire somebody say hey i'm praying for you what can i do for you can i share something with you how can i be a blessing to you we can write cards and notes Uh, we can plod and be an encourager our words can be a blessing to help others serve how can we be a blessing today let's bow our heads in order prayer god we don't like to deal with the uncomfortable reality that death is coming for each one of us. And God, the truth is, we don't know when. It may be today. It may be 10 years from today. Help us to live in such a way that we're ready to step into eternity. Somebody does not know you as Jesus Christ, as their Savior today, Lord, may they come to that point of repenting of their sin, putting their faith and trust in Jesus of what he's done for them there on the cross and living for him today. May they take that first step of faith as they begin that journey with Jesus Christ today. God, for those who have, may we live prepared 
encouraging and blessing others. May we let the love of Jesus Christ that is given to us flow through us to lift them up. God, as you've blessed us, may we be a blessing to others. May we persevere even in difficult times. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand together this morning. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Uh, there, number 439, Jesus, I come. If you don't know Christ as Savior this morning, this invitation is for you. Uh, get ready for eternity today. Uh, we can't wait until we think that time's coming close. We need to prepare today to trust Christ as Savior today, to live for Him today. God's moving and working in your heart. You respond as God calls you to respond this morning. that transformation that Jesus Christ has given to us, let's share that with others by speaking blessing into their life today. Lord, we thank you for that hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that even as we talk of death, we don't have to be afraid of death. That you have conquered death once and for all, and you give that victory to us, that we can face death with peace and with confidence. And because of that, help us to bless others all the way to the very end. Let us point them towards Jesus Christ who can make that difference and strengthen them to live for him. And may we encourage and inspire them through our words and through our actions. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll take your seats for just a moment here this morning. I just want to share uh, some of the things that are going on there. I, as we sang that song this morning, I, I almost got up and said it's about time we you know, had the ushers come forward. We'll take an offering. Test me, try me, prove me. Matter of fact, and Malachi is one of the few places that actually you are encouraged to test God. Most of the time you're encouraged, do not test God, right? Don't try me, don't test me. Uh, there in Malachi, as it comes to bringing the tithes into the storehouse, he says this, test me and see if I won't pour out a blessing to you. Uh, a wonderful opportunity for us to live out our faith, to engage uh, God, uh, to live there in relationship with Him. And so I want to encourage you to be faithful there as God has blessed you with material resources, worship Him with those by giving back to Him. And the opportunities we have, they're available to do that. Uh, 
some of the things that are coming up tomorrow night, we have a music team meeting there at 6.30. Uh, and then August 31st, we have a game night uh, there for others. Uh, we were encouraged to invite that if you come Wednesday night and they have additional uh, bananas left over, you're invited to come down to the fellowship hall and enjoy some banana splits on the youth group there. And so if you want a banana split, come out to, to Wednesday night there and experience the blessing that we have of worshiping the Lord there together. We appreciate what uh, those who came out and served yesterday, the difference that you make. Uh, we're grateful there for that. Let me close by uh, giving this word of blessing from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you today. You are dismissed today. Thank you.